Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 19th June 2019. The list of articles which has been chosen for today's analysis along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru, Delhi and Thiruvannathapuram editions are provided here. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping for the displayed articles is given in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the timestamping is also provided in the comment section. Let's move on to our first article discussion. This is an editorial about the one nation and one election concept. The discussion will be relevant in current events of national importance, then in Indian polity and governance, particularly under political system. Then the discussion is more important in GS paper 2 under the area parliament and state legislature, then also in important aspects of governance, transparency and accountability. In this editorial, the author discusses about the resurrection or reappearance of the famous debate, that is the debate on one nation, one election. Recently, our Prime Minister has called for a meeting with the leaders of other political parties to debate on the subject of one nation, one election. The author says that the Prime Minister had continuously tried to draw the attention on this issue for the last five years. So, he has now finally called for a meeting. So, before going into the editorial, let us now first know what is this one nation, one election mean. It means simultaneous elections. In a popular sense, if we see simultaneous uh, elections involves elections to all the three tiers of the constitutional institutions which are uh, taking place in a synchronized or a combined manner. The three tiers are one house of the people which is also known as the Lok Sabha, then second state assemblies which is also known as Vidhan Sabha and the third is the local bodies. According to Law Commission of India, this means that a voter casts his or her vote for electing members to all the tires of the government on the same day. Look, simultaneous elections would not mean that voting across the country for the Lok Sabha and the, all the state as assemblies will take place on a single day. In a vast country like India, the general elections can take place only in phases. So, simultaneous election means the voters in a particular constituency would vote for state assembly and Lok Sabha on the same day. Now, if we look at the history of elections in India, we can find that during the first two decades after independence, general elections for the House of the People and the State Legislative Assemblies were held simultaneously. This was during the years 1951 to 52, uh, then in 1957, then in 1962 and then also in 1967. But the cycle of simultaneous elections were disrupted due to the dissolution of certain state assemblies in 1968 and 1969. And then uh, also the dissolution of Lok Sabha in 1970 led to subsequent general elections to Lok Sabha in 1971. Now this was the background regarding the simultaneous elections. Let us now discuss the editorial. First the author discusses about the support which has been shown so far for this idea of one nation one election. He points to the 2014 manifesto of BJP. Manifesto is nothing but the public declaration which is made by the political party or, ca or candidate before election regarding its policy and aims if the political party or candidate it is elected by the people. In short we can say that it is the promises made by the political parties and the candidates before the election. The manifesto of BJP said that it will seek to evolve a method of holding assembly and Lok Sabha elections simultaneously and this will be achieved through consultation with other political parties. The reason as stated by the party was it will uh, reduce election expenses for both political parties and government and it will also ensure certain stability for the state governments. This is because when there is one nation one election there will be a, a better functioning of the government for a longer period of time and it will enable the ministers to, fo to focus on welfare of people instead of concentrating on the next elections which are being held at some other states. Then again in the 2019 manifesto, BJP has uh, mentioned about uh, simultaneous elections for parliament, state assemblies and local bodies. This was to ensure efficient utilization of government resources, reduction in government expenditure, efficient uh, utilization of security forces and also for effective policy planning. 
The manifesto also included that the party will try to build a consensus on this issue with all the political parties. So, this is the reason the Prime Minister is calling for an all party meeting for discussions about one nation, one election. Even during an interview with a news channel in January 2018, the Prime Minister highlighted the demerits of being in a constant election mode for a country. He pointed out that the elections happen on account of mobilization of a large section of security forces, bureaucracy and political machinery. And they all have to be mobilized for up to 200 days a year for the election process only. Next, even the re-elected Chief Minister of Odisha has already welcomed this idea. He noted that frequent elections will affect the development of the country. This is because during elections, whether for the Lok Sabha or the assemblies, the entire administrative setup throughout the country slows down. And all other normal functions and activities of the government, including the developmental work, are pushed to the background. Then also, when there is a frequent election, the political parties focus on the need to win the next election. This makes the short-term political urgency an immediate priority. So, as a result, the sound long-term economic planning often gets the least priority. Even there have been various instances in the past when the governments have preferred to postpone the implementation of difficult structural reforms due to elections. Then, in 1999, even the Law Commission has recommended simultaneous elections to Lok Sabha, Vidhan Sabha, local bodies. Then, this matter of simultaneous election was also examined by a parliamentary standing committee on personal public grievances, law and justice in December 2015. The committee noted that the holding of simultaneous elections to Lok Sabha and state assemblies would uh, reduce the massive expenditure that is currently incurred for the conduct of separate elections. And it will also reduce the policy paralysis that results from the imposition of model code of conduct during election time. And then it will also reduce the impact on delivery of essential services to citizens. And finally, it will reduce the burden on crucial manpower that is deployed during the election time. And this observation was referred to the Election Commission of India and both the Parliamentary Standing Committee and the Election Commission of India supported the simultaneous elections. ECA also noted that the suggestion of one nation, one election seems logical and uh, the simultaneous elections makes perfect sense because the voters for all three tires are the same and the polling booths are the same and the staff or security is the same. Next, the author lists some genuine concerns with regard to the frequent elections. Firstly, the author says it is becoming more and more difficult to contest elections. This is because the 2019 general election was the most expensive on record. It was reported that a huge amount of uh, 60,000 crore rupees was spent on the whole election exercise itself. Also, there is no cap on the expenditure incurred by political parties during the elections. They spend shocking amounts of money in every election. So, it is argued that simultaneously holding elections would help to reduce this cost. Secondly, frequent elections also hamper or obstruct the normal functioning of the government and then it also disrupts civic life. This happens because the model code of conduct comes into operation as soon as the election commission announces the election dates. The model code of conduct or MCC is a set of guidelines applicable to the political parties, candidates, the election machinery, the government agencies uh, to ensure free and fair elections. Also, the imposition of the MCC refrains the government from uh, announcing any financial grants in any form or promises in that period. Then uh, there is a refrain on laying foundation stones, etc. for projects or schemes of any kind. Then uh, there is a refrain to make uh, any promise of uh, construction of roads, provisions of uh, drinking water facilities, etc. Finally, there is also a refrain to make any new appointments in government, public undertakings, etc. This means that the government cannot announce any new schemes during this period. So, in turn, this results to policy paralysis. Policy paralysis means when there is insufficient policies for development and welfare of people from the side of the government. Then, because of the MCC, the government cannot make any new appointments 
or transfer or even appoint officials and additionally all the manpower of the government is involved in the conduct of elections when there is frequent elections then another concern the author has is uh, during the time of elections communalism casteism and corruption are at their peak so frequent elections mean that there is no respite or break from these evils at all then the author discusses about the hurdles in the implementation of simultaneous elections firstly the author points the problem of dissolution he says that this creates an unworkable condition for simultaneous elections both in theory and also in practice in a democracy so the author raises a question about how will one nation one election work in case of premature dissolution of lok sabha premature dissolution means dissolving the lok sabha before completion of its full term that is before 5 years so the author says if this dissolution happens then will the state assemblies will also be dissolved or not then similarly he asks one more question that uh, uh, whether what will happen when uh, one of the state assemblies is dissolved if the state assembly is dissolved will the entire country has to go to polls again or not these questions need to be addressed first then secondly the author talks about the implementation of schemes of the government during the mcc period that is the model code of conduct period the author notes that only the new schemes are stopped during the period because the new schemes could be considered equal to luring or bribing voters on the eve of elections but uh, all the ongoing programs are unhindered or undisturbed during this period also with the prior approval of uh, election commission new announcements that are in urgent public interest can be made so the author says the development process will not be hindered to a larger extent then additionally the author says that if we consider accountability the frequent elections are not so bad because frequent elections ensure that the politicians have to show their faces to voters like regularly also it will lead to creation of work opportunities grass root level as many will be engaged in the election process then the most important point about frequent election is that it is undoubtedly enhances the federal spirit of our country which among other things requires that local and national issues are not mixed up because every assembly election reflects and raises the local issues and these local issues might appear small at the national level so these issues have to be addressed by the local leadership only but the lok sabha elections are held on national issues so when simultaneous elections are held local issues may be given less importance it could also lead to the voters getting confused about national and local issues while voting so as uh, there are so many hurdles in simultaneous elections the author gives two alternative suggestions to deal with the problem that arise due to frequent elections firstly the problem of uncontrolled election campaign expenditure can be solved by introducing a cap or limit on the expenditure by political parties then for this state funding of political parties is also a solution the state funding should be based on the poll performance of the political parties here the state funding means that the government gives funds to political parties or candidates for contesting elections the main purpose of state funding is to curb the corruption during election spending then another solution to control the expenditure is the banning of private and corporate fund collection the second suggestion is that the poll duration can be reduced from 2 to 3 months to about 33 to 35 days this can be done if more central armed police forces can be provided or deployed by the government it is because during every election the problems like violence social media related offenses and issues related to the enforcement of the mcc arise so the author says this will vanish if the election is conducted in a single day so for conducting election in a single day raising more battalions is the effective solution and also it will help in creation of more jobs so finally the author concludes that the happening of simultaneous elections would be a far reaching or a comprehensive electoral reform so if it is to be implemented 
a solid political consensus is needed. Then an agenda of comprehensive electoral reforms should be added to the political consensus. And uh, also the pros and cons that is the advantages and disadvantages of the simultaneous elections need to be properly and appropriately assessed. And all these should be done along with the availability of other practical alternatives for conducting free and fair elections. Hence, without addressing all these concerns and hurdles, it is difficult to have simultaneous elections. So, that is why the author has given the title as an idea whose time may not have come, meaning that still these uh, concerns have not been addressed. So, the electoral reform of simultaneous elections will not happen so soon. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. The displayed mains question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article, which is about India's performance in providing drinking water and sanitation to its people. The analysis of this news article will be helpful in your prelims preparation under current events of national and international importance and then in economic and social development, particularly under sustainable development and social sector initiatives. The analysis will also be helpful in your mains preparation in general studies paper 2 under government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation. Then also under issues relating to development and management of social sector relating to health and human resources. If you see this news article just mentions as a monitoring report by UN organization. The actual report name is the joint monitoring program report progress on drinking water sanitation and hygiene 2000 to 2017 special focus on inequalities this report is released by who or unicef joint monitoring program for water supply sanitation and hygiene this who unicef joint monitoring program is the official united nations mechanism who is world health organization and unicef is the united nations children's fund uh, as the name indicates, this program is to monitor the country-wise, regional-wise and also the global process of the Sustainable Development Goal targets that are related to universal and equitable access to safe drinking water, sanitation and hygiene. The SDG target or the SDG goal which is related to this is SDG goal number 6 that is clean water and sanitation. This report will be an authenticated source which provides comparable estimates internationally. This report will also serve as a reference to make policy decisions and resource allocations especially at the international level. We saw that the actual report name is the Joint Monitoring Program Report Progress on Drinking Water, Sanitation and Hygiene 2002-2017 special focus on inequalities. This report mentions that while significant progress has been made towards the achieving of universal access to basic water, sanitation and hygiene, still there is or uh, there are huge gaps in the quality of services which have been provided in majority of the countries including India. Now let us discuss the news article. The joint monitoring report first discusses about open defecation. Open defecation means the practice whereby people go out in fields, bushes, forests, open bodies of water and other open spaces to defecate rather than using the toilet. If you see, open defecation poses a serious threat to the health of children in India. Also, open defecation exposes women to the danger of physical attacks and encounters such as snake bites. Then poor sanitation also cripples or disables the nation national development where workers produce less, live shorter lives, save less and invest less and are less able to send their children to school. The joint monitoring report uh, states that worldwide about 650 million people that is uh, 65 crore people have stopped practice in open defecation between 2000 and 2017. Out of this 65 crore almost uh, two thirds that is approximately 43.5 crore are Indians who stopped practicing open defecation. The report also mentions that India is responsible for almost single handedly dragging the world towards achieving sustainable development goal of ending open defecation. So know that ending the open defecation is a target number 6.2 under SDG goal clean water and sanitation. 
The report also mentions that the South Asian region which includes India as well has accounted for almost three fourths of the population who have stopped defecating in the open uh, between 2000 and 2017 which is approximately 50 crores uh, out of the total 65 crores and out of the 2.1 billion people that is uh, out of uh, 210 crore people who have gained access to basic sanitation services over this time period globally that is from uh, 2000 to 2017 48.6 crore people live in India. Then India's drinking water and sanitation secretary has said that India's Swachh Bharat mission has been an example and inspiration to other countries especially in Africa and also for the countries of the East and South Asia. He also said that Nigeria sent a delegation to study Swachh Bharat program. The secretary has mentioned four reasons for the success of this program uh, which are political leadership, public financing, partnership and people's participation and this is a model worth to be shared or emulated across other countries of the world. So in this slide let us now see about Swachh Bharat mission in brief. Swachh Bharat mission has been launched by the Prime Minister of India on 2nd October 2014 to accelerate the efforts to achieve universal sanitation coverage and also to put focus on sanitation. The mission coordinator is the secretary of ministry of drinking water and sanitation. Also know that there are two sub missions under Swachh Bharat. One is the Swachh Bharat mission Gramin and then another is the Swachh Bharat mission urban. Gramin means village and urban means we know the urban India. The Swachh Bharat mission aims to achieve a Swachh Bharat or clean India by 2019 so that it will be a fitting tribute to Mahatma Gandhi on his 150th birth anniversary. If you remember about the overall observations made in the report that we saw earlier, it has said that the quality of services provided needs to be improved. India also faces the same problem. Though the Swachh Bharat program is a success with this construction of new toilets, the problem is that now these toilets are producing large amounts of solid and liquid waste and India simply does not have the ability to treat and dispose of these wastes safely. The report also mentions that only 30% of the country's wastewater is treated at wastewater treatment plants. If you see the global average for wastewater treatment is 80%. So India needs to improve in this front. Then the drinking water and sanitation secretary has uh, said that the solid and liquid waste management will be the focus of Swachh Bharat phase 2. He has also said that India will launch the roadmap and strategy for phase 2 program in the next month. If you see the human right to sanitation means that people not only have a right to a hygienic toilet but also have a right not to be negatively affected by unmanaged fecal waste. This is most relevant and important especially for the poor and marginalized groups. The report mentions that these poor and marginalized groups tend to get disproportionately affected by other people's unmanaged fecal waste and sewage. So we can also tell uh, this is an inequality though the access to toilet is ensured mostly as of now. Next the joint monitoring report speaks about piped water facilities. The report reveals that 1.8 billion people or 180 crore people have gained access to basic drinking water services since 2000. But there are vast inequalities in the accessibility, availability and quality of these services. The report shows that India has increased the percentage of its population with access to a protected drinking water source with less than 30 minutes away. This is from 79% in 2000 to 93% in 2017. However, the monitoring report shows that there has been absolutely no growth in the population with access to piped water facilities from 2000 to 2017 in India. If you see the percentage of households getting piped water has remained stagnant at 44% over this 17 year period. Also, large inequalities remain between rural and urban areas of India. In rural India, only 32% of the population have access to piped water and only 68% of the population have access to piped water in urban area. So, 
we can clearly see that the access to piped water in rural is less than half of what urban India can access. Then the drinking water and sanitation secretary has also said that drinking water is now the highest priority of the development agenda for this new government. Also a new scheme uh, tentatively which is called as Nal Se Jal is being drafted this month. Remember, you can use the statistics discussed here in any of your main answer writing related to government policies on sanitation and drinking water. And also remember that SDG goal number 6 is clean water and sanitation. With this, we have come to the end of this analysis. The split practice prelims question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article which is about the speaker of Lok Sabha. The discussion will be relevant in current events of national importance, then also in Indian polity and governance, particularly under political system. Then the discussion is more important in GS paper 2 under the area parliament and its structure, functioning, conduct of business, powers and privileges. Then also in structure, organization and functioning of the executive. Then also in appointment to various constitutional posts, its powers, functions. The news is that the National Dem Democratic Alliance, which is led by BJP, has named the Member of Parliament from Rajasthan, Shri Om Birla, as Speaker of Lok Sabha. He has assumed office today after being elected by the members of Lok Sabha. Mr. Birla has been uh, a MLA for three terms in the Rajasthan Assembly and he represents the Kota constituency in the Lok Sabha. His name was proposed by the Prime Minister, the Minister of Parliamentary Affairs, the Defence Minister, the Home Minister and the Roads and Highways Minister for the position of Speaker of Lok Sabha. Even the political party Congress has told that it would support Mr. Birla's candidature. Actually, uh, it is the norm that experienced MPs are considered for the position of the Speaker of Lok Sabha. So, let us understand the Speaker of Lok Sabha from the examination point of view. The Speaker of Lok Sabha occupies a pivotal or crucial position in our parliamentary democracy. It has been said that while the members of the parliament represent the individual constituencies, the Speaker represents the full authority of the house, that is Lok Sabha itself. The Speaker symbolizes the dignity and power of the house over which she or he is presiding. Therefore, it is expected that the holder of this office is of high dignity and she or he has to be one who can represent the house in all its manifestations. The speaker is considered as the true guardian of the traditions of parliamentary democracy. And also in India, the powers of the office of the speaker are vested through the constitution, through the rules of procedure and conduct of business in Lok Sabha and also through the practices and convention. These powers are to help the speaker in the smooth conduct of the parliamentary proceedings and for protecting the independence and impartiality of the office. The constitution of India provides that the speaker's salary and allowances are not to be voted by parliament and the speaker's salary and allowances are to be charged on the, on the consolidated fund of India. See, all the revenues received by the government by the way of taxes like income tax, central excise, customs and other receipts flowing to the government in connection with the conduct of govern government business that is the non-tax revenues are credited into this consolidated fund. And also this has been provided under the article 266 uh, clause 1 of the constitution of India. All the expenditures of the government is incurred from this fund and no amount can be withdrawn from the fund without authorization from the parliament. Then let us see the term of office of the speaker. The term of office of the speaker is from the date of her election till immediately before the first meeting of the Lok Sabha after the dissolution of the Lok Sabha to which the speaker was elected. This might be a little confusing. It literally means the term of the office of the speaker is from the date of her election till immediately before the first meeting of the new Lok Sabha. Okay. The speaker is eligible for the re-election also. Then on the dissolution of the Lok Sabha, the speaker ceases or discontinues to be a member of the house, but she does not vacate her office. Also, at any time, the speaker may resign from office by writing under her hand 
to the deputy speaker which literally means writing resignation letter to the deputy speaker next the speaker can be removed from office only on resolution of the house that is lok sabha the resolution should be passed by a majority of all the members of the house it is also mandatory to give a minimum of a 14 days notice of the intention to move the resolution then also know that the speaker is the conventional head of the lok sabha and uh, being this principal spokesperson or the spokesman the speaker represents the collective voice of lok sabha and of course the speaker is the ultimate arbiter that is the person who settles disputes and the speaker is the interpreter of those provisions which relates to the functioning of the lok sabha then also the speaker's decisions are final and binding and ordinarily it cannot be questioned challenged or criticized next let us see the election of speaker the speaker is elected from among the members of lok sabha by a simple majority of members present in voting in the house that is the lok sabha simple majority refers to the majority of more than 50% of the members present in voting actually no specific qualifications are prescribed for being elected as speaker the constitution only requires that the speaker should be a member of the house but uh, an understanding of the constitution and the laws of the country and the rules of procedures and the conventions of parliament is considered to be a major asset for the holder of the office of the speaker now look the election of speaker of the lok sabha is an important event in the life of the lok sabha because one of the first acts of the newly constituted house that is lok sabha is to elect the speaker usually a member belonging to the ruling party is elected as the speaker also a convention has evolved over the years according to this convention the ruling party nominates its candidate for the position of speaker this nomination happens after the informal consultations with the lead leaders of other parties and groups in the lok sabha uh, in the same way the speaker shri om birla has been elected this convention ensures that once elected the speaker enjoys the respect of all sections of the house and there are also instances when members not belonging to the ruling party or coalition were elected to the office of the speaker so once a decision on the candidate is taken her or his name is normally proposed by the prime minister or the minister of parliamentary affairs as we saw in the beginning actually there are many functions of the speaker uh, we cannot discuss it in one day it will confuse you so we will see uh, the other functions of the speaker in the coming days with this we have come to the end of this discussion the split practice prelims question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next article which is an editorial with respect to the recent violence against a junior doctor over a death of a patient in the state of west bengal this article discussion will be relevant in your prelims syllabus under the area current events of national importance and then also under indian polity and governance The discussion will also be relevant in your main syllabus in GS paper 2 under the area government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation and then also under issues relating to development and management of social sector relating to health the article states that a junior doctor was attacked on June 10th of 2019 they were attacked allegedly by the relatives of a patient who died in the hospital this attack on a junior doctor has sparked agitation which has spread to other parts of the country also the strike was carried out by the doctors nurses medical personnel almost for a week the demand was better security for the medical personnel in the hospitals finally the strike or the agitation came to end when the chief minister of west bengal met the doctors involved in democratic action the chief minister of west bengal has assured that the safety of doctors is the priority for the government the author says such kind of reprisal attacks on doctors by agitated relatives of patients who died during treatment are bound to happen here the word reprisal means retaliation or taking revenge the relatives think that it is the doctor's mistake that the patient has died and they attack the doctors for revenge this violence that happened recently and the violence on doctors on these lines are always the result of systemic problems such as infrastructural and manpower constraints 
that is lack of infrastructure and manpower in the healthcare system. These problems adversely affect the optimal or the required attention to the patients. The matter is that these constraints affect the effective health service delivery and may reflect on the patient's health. Thus, the relatives or the caregivers get angry on the doctors saying things like uh, the patient has died because the patient was unattended by doctor for two hours. If they would have attended earlier, he would have not died. So, now they get angry and show anger on doctors. The author says such issues are bound to happen. Here, we must note that whenever there is a doubt with respect to the medical care offered to a patient, there is every possibility for a relative of a patient to file a complaint to the polis and the FIR also be filed. These cases are called as medical legal cases. In such cases, police investigate with the help of scientific experts and fix the responsibility, like whether the patient died because of natural course or by the lack of care by the doctor or the death is because of any wrong treatment given to the patient or the death is because of any delay in attending a patient. But here what we have to note is that how far the police officials cooperate with the victim in registering the FIR and the remaining legal process is a matter of great doubt. So, in the absence of such cooperation and in the absence of having such knowledge, the people show their wrath or are angry on the doctors. The author says that the doctors also work in stressful environments and also sometimes also under political pressure zones. Additionally, the lack of infrastructure and manpower is also contributing factor to the stressful environment and the political pressure. The author says that the issue of violence against the doctors has been seen as a law and order problem and this is just one way of looking at the problem but if the government wants to ensure that no such attacks are hap happening in the country there is a real solution this real solution we will see in the end of this discussion we saw that this issue was treated as a law and order problem that is attacking doctors is seen as a law and order problem Generally, in police parlance, law and order offences relate to those offences that are committed against a person's body. For example, grievous hurt, murder, attempt to murder, etc. These offences are called as bodily offences. These offences mostly have the potential to affect the law and orderly conduct in the society. But the less serious offences against the property uh, comes under the crime wing of a police station meaning these less serious property offences do not come under law and order wing. This attack therefore is seen as a law and order issue and hence the union health minister has asked the state governments to take stringent actions against anyone who assaults or attacks the medical personnel. In 2017 an inter-ministerial committee was constituted under ministry of health to review various issues raised by Indian Medical Association. This inter-ministerial committee has recommended to the health ministry to suggest to all the states to enact a law as soon as possible to protect doctors. This is for the states that do not have a law to protect doctors. The Indian Medical Association also submitted a draft legislation or a model law for this purpose. This draft act is named as the protection of medical service persons and medical service institutions, prevention of violence and damage or loss of property act of 2017. This is a draft or a model act submitted by the IMA. This is still a draft and has not become the law of the land because it was not yet introduced in the parliament. The author says that this draft was also circulated to the states by the health minister. The purpose of sending the draft is uh, those states that do not have a law to deal with uh, violence against doctors shall see this draft and enact a legislation in their state. Then the author talks about two states that have a law in their state jurisdiction for the protection of doctors. One is West Bengal where the uh, present agitation by the doctors started and the other is Tamil Nadu. In both the states, the law provides for imprisonment and fine to the offender. Here the offenders are those who attack the doctors. The author says the presence of law did not prevent uh, such violence against the medical fraternity. So, law is not the real solution for preventing violence. 
the real solution is in improving health infrastructure that is upgrading healthcare and its infrastructure also there has to be adequate manpower at all levels in the healthcare system the patients have to be informed by counseling about various adverse outcomes of a particular treatment also uh, providing basic security in medical institutions for the doctors nurses medical and nursing students and other staffs should be involved in healthcare this is the real solution that will prevent violence therefore the title of the article is preventing violence the author says having a law to protect doctors is good but a healthcare upgrade is must in other words he implies that if medical infrastructure and manpower constraints are not addressed such violence against doctors will continue in various parts of the country with this we have come to the end of this article discussion the displayed practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the final article discussion which is also in response to the recent violence against medical service persons in the state of west bengal similar to the previous editorial article this article discussion will be of same syllabus framework as it will also be relevant under the area current events of national importance and under indian polity and governance in prelim syllabus then the discussion will be relevant in your main syllabus in gs paper 2 under the area government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation and then also under issues relating to development and management of social sector relating to health in this open editorial the author actually examines the present work sitting in hospitals in which majority of such events of violence takes place the author talks these things with respect to the settings in a government hospital the most common scenario is that the patient will be taken to the casualty ward in the hospital in a critical condition if a patient dies then the family members perceive that the treatment was not given in time also the hospital authorities display insensitivity when the family members of the patients question about the delay so this angers the family of the patient The author who is also a surgeon states that the emergency wards of government hospitals of India are chaotic disorganized and look like conflict zones the word chaotic means complete confusion and disorder the author says that the main reason behind this is that uh, in India there is a complete absence of globally recognized protocol called as triage in medical parlance triage protocol involves a rapid examination of a patient immediately when he or she is brought to the hospital this rapid examination is to determine whether the patient needs instant or immediate care or early care or otherwise that is whether care can be given after a certain time now in the absence of this protocol the emergency wards are often occupied by patients with all sorts of minor injuries that is why the author calls the emergency wards are chaotic and disorganized this is a problem because those who require proper immediate attention cannot be given such attention and care in such a scenario and the reason is the complete absence of triage protocol in government hospitals the author states that around 90% of the persons in emergency wards have minor injuries these 90% of the patients with minor injuries could have been treated in a smaller setting other than the emergency ward then there is one another reason why the emergency ward setting in government hospital have many patients with minor injuries the another reason is when a person attacks another injuries occur then the person with the injury will go to the police station to file complaint against the person who injured him then the police send the complainant to government hospital to give med medical care and also to strengthen the case then the fir will be filed after getting the opinion of the doctor whether the injury is a simple hurt or grievous hurt or hurt by dangerous weapons this is done by the police officials to strengthen the case this is because uh, there are different sections in the indian penal code that deals with these kinds of offenses differently and the punishment also varies according to these sections the author says that the complainants even though they have minor injury are brought into the emergency wards for strengthening the case 
So, this work setting creates a burden on the hospital staff. The staff actually have to treat the 10% of the patient in emergency wards. It is only these patients who require immediate attention. But the presence of other set of patients and this burden is making the staff unable to give attention and better treatment to the needy and to save their lives. The author says that in the government hospital which are attached with medical colleges, the doctors and staffs are having huge workload. In suburban and rural hospitals, there is lack of funds, lack of staffs and lack of medical equipment. This results into poor capacity of these hospitals in handling the sick patients. These are the author's statements with respect to the work setting in the government hospitals. Now, the author says that the people will respond in a perverse or in an annoying manner when they see a huge delays in treating the immediate care requiring patients. When they see unclean and ill-maintained ambulances, they get angry and uh, they behave in perverse manner when they see a lack of equipment or malfunctioning of equipment in a hospital. People respond in such a manner in government hospital because people see that there is quicker and organized care delivery in private hospitals. But the common man is not getting the same service delivery in a public hospital. So the author gives answer to a question about can a law that imposes punishment for violence against doctors work in preventing the attacks. The author says not likely. This is because the attacks are not planned. When the family members bring a patient to the hospital, they will come to get the required care. They will not come with a plan to attack the doctors. The author says that the attacks are impulsive or uncontrollable responses in an emotional moment. Therefore, in such instances, the author suggests for examining who conveyed the information of death of the patient to the family members. It is about who delivered the message of death. It matters where the message was conveyed to the relatives and how the message was conveyed. For example, if a doctor conveys such an information in an irresponsive manner, this may easily provoke or precipitate listeners to be behave violently at the doctor. The author says that the news has to be conveyed in a planned and organized manner. In the absence of such communication, there could be violence. The author asks the doctors not to imitate the impulsive responses of the attackers. Rather, they have to focus on bringing several structural and policy changes in the way the Indian hospital system works. These structural and policy changes can ensure the reduction of the perception that there is medical negligence in caring. It is not the increased security that may help in controlling incidents of violence on doctors. But the structural and policy changes in the way of hospitals work may control such incidents. The medical associations should take a lead role in demanding policy changes. The author concludes by saying that common man is caught between the pincer of feeble or weak public health sector and our unaffordable private health sector and that the large majority of the patients going to the government hospitals show tremendous patience, tolerance and resilience and trust and both the doctors and patients deserve better. Here he means that the patients deserve better treatment and deserve respect for their tolerance and trust and the doctors also deserve better working conditions, better health care infrastructure. The author compares the incidence of violence against doctors as a symptom of a disease. This is a disease we have seen in our discussion. According to this author, the absence of triage system, absence of funds, absence of manpower, absence of infrastructure, then presence of medical negligence and poor health care in government hospitals as compared to private hospitals collectively is a disease. If this disease is not cured, we will be seeing symptoms frequently. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion session. The first question is about the joint monitoring program for water supply, sanitation and hygiene. The question asks, this program is an official United Nations mechanism. Uh, it is a joint monitoring program of which of the following? Now, if you had listened to our discussion, we saw that uh, today's report was jointly released by World Health Organization and United Nations Children's Fund. 
that is WHO and UNICEF as because uh, this joint monitoring program for water supply, sanitation and hygiene is carried out by these two organizations only. So, here option 2 and 4 are the correct. So, the final answer to this question is option D 2 and 4 only. But also know that uh, this joint monitoring program has released the report titled progress on drinking water sanitation and hygiene 2007 to 2017 special focus on inequalities. A question may be asked based on this title also. Now, if you look at the second question, it is about the speaker of the Lok Sabha. Now, here the first statement is correct. As we saw that the speaker is the conventional head of Lok Sabha. Now, Lok Sabha is also called as house of the people and it can also be called as lower house. So, for memory you can uh, uh, observe the L word as common in Lok Sabha and lower house. So, you can remember Lok Sabha is the lower house. So, normally uh, in examination they play with these three words Lok Sabha, lower house and house of the people to confuse you. Now, if you look at the second statement it states that the speaker of Lok Sabha is elected from among the members of Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha by a simple majority of members present and voting. We saw during a discussion that uh, the speaker of Lok Sabha is elected by a simple majority of members present and voting. So, that part of this statement is correct. But uh, we also discussed that the speaker of Lok Sabha is elected from among the members of Lok Sabha. We did not mention anything about Rajya Sabha in our discussion today. So, you can remember by recalling today's discussion that the speaker of Lok Sabha is elected from among the members of Lok Sabha by a simple majority of members present and voting. So, this makes statement 2 as the incorrect statement. Now, if you look at the third statement, it is correct. It states that the speaker of Lok Sabha is eligible for re-election. That is, a speaker can be re-elected as the speaker for the new Lok Sabha also. But uh, in independent India, no speaker has been re-elected so far. Here, the statement only talks about the eligibility not it does not state that the speaker has been re-elected already so this makes the statement as the correct statement the question asks for the correct statement here statement 1 and 3 are correct so the final answer to this question is option 1 and 3 only or here you can also adopt one more uh, method of uh, attending the question that is the elimination method because when we saw that uh, statement 2 is incorrect if you see the options given below, three options have statement 2. So, you can directly eliminate all these three options, then you can arrive at option A, 1 and 3 only. Now, let us see one mains question based on GS paper 2. One nation, one election. Examine the desirability and feasibility of holding simultaneous elections. Now, here the word desirability means advantages and feasibility means disadvantages. So, you have to simply mention the uh, advantages and disadvantages of simultaneous elections. So, for advantages, you can mention about how it will reduce election expenses for political parties and the government and it will uh, ensure the stability for state government and it will also ensure sufficient utilization of resources and uh, sufficient utilization of security forces and it will also ensure effective policy planning and for that you can also quote the uh, report by the parliamentary standing committee on personal public grievances law and justice in december 2015 here the committee noted that the holding of simultaneous elections to lok sabha and state assemblies would reduce the massive expenditure that is currently incurred for the conduct of separate elections then it will reduce the policy paralysis that results from the imposition of the model code of conduct during election time then it will reduce the impact on delivery of essential services to the citizens then finally it will reduce the burden on crucial manpower that is deployed during election time whenever you try to answer a mains question try to give try to give points on expert opinions and also try to quote the points mentioned in a report presented by a famous committee etc then for the feasibility or the disadvantages of uh, simultaneous elections, you can uh, talk about the advantages in the frequent elections because when it becomes the advantages of frequent elections, it will be a disadvantage on the front of simultaneous elections. Like you can mention frequent elections uh, are good for accountability and uh, 
it will create work at grassroots level then uh, local and national issues will not be mixed up and also still there is no answer for questions like uh, if premature dissolution of lok sabha happens what will happen to the state assemblies will they be dissolved or not and the questions like a dissolution of state assembly will result in poll for entire country or not etc also try to add your own view points based on your understanding on today's analysis now let us see another main question based on gs paper 2 uh, which states the quality of healthcare system in india requires major improvement in the light of recent incidents of violence on medical personnel do you think that the enactment and enforcement of legislations for the protection of medical personnel will address the issue discuss a similarly framed question may be asked in the mains exam under gs paper 2 for this question you may briefly talk about the recent incident in west bengal in two or three lines also briefly highlight the quality of healthcare system in the country here you may say that india is short of 6 lakh doctors and there is a shortage of about 20 lakh nurses this makes our healthcare system substandard then you can also quote the doctor to population ratio in india which is 1 to 10189 and uh, India needs around 6 lakh doctors to reach the WHO recommendations of 1 is to 1000. Then you can also quote the nurse to population ratio at present which is uh, 1 is to 483. And India requires 20 lakh more nurses to achieve the standard of 1 is to 250. Then for the second part of the question, you shall discuss whether do you think the enactment and enforcement of legislation for the protection of medical personnel will address the issue of violence against the doctors or medical personnel. Here you may take the stand of author that despite the loss, violence happens because of a quality of health service delivery. This violence is because of absence of counselling to patients about adverse outcomes of a treatment. This violence is because thousands of patients are not being attended by the medical practitioners at the needed time or the golden hours. And also because of uh, lack of manpower and infrastructure. In this way, you may write the answer for this question. Or you can take the other stand by saying that enforcement of uh, laws will prevent. And you can write your own viewpoints and try to substantiate those viewpoints with this we have come to the end of today's sessions if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to shankar is academy youtube channel for more updates on civil service examination preparation